something real, it's a tool that is used on some networks to measure the bandwidth. So you are in the internet and you want to measure the bandwidth you have between two computers. And of course you don't know anything about the network. So, one way to do that is to use what we call packet pairs. What does it mean, packet pairs? It means that you are going to send two packets that are close to each other. So you have no delay between these two packets. Okay? So here I suppose that my network is empty. So somewhere in my network, I have here a link, let's say for example a 2 megabit link, and I go here to a link at 1 megabit per second. So I am using the store and forward technique. It means that when I will send this packet, so the first one, the green one, will take longer <coughs> to be sent, because here I have less bandwidth, and so the red one will arrive before the green one has been completely sent. And just after the green one, I will send the red one. Then I come back, I go back to a link with higher speed. So it, of course, when I have received totally the green one, I can send it on the link. And here, of course, I have not fully received when I finished to send the green one. I have, not, uh, I have not finished to receive the red one. So I cannot send it on the other link. So I have to wait the end of the red one transmission to send it on the other link. So I will introduce a delay between these two packets. So originally, I have no delay. And after that, I have a delay. OK? So the question is, can you find a formula that tells you what is the bandwidth of this link in the middle? If you do, so you have to measure things here. And by measuring things here, you can discover the bandwidth of this middle link. The span, the delay between yeah. the green and the red. Yes. Is yes. due to the bottleneck. Yeah, yeah. Because I am in store and forward. So if I draw it another way, I have on the first link, I'm sending the green one here. So the green one. We arrive on another link. This link is sorry. This link is longer. Uh, is, has a longer, a smaller bandwidth. So it takes more time to send it. And then I come back to a link with IO speed. Okay, so now, if I send after a green one, mm -hmm. so the green, uh, red one, the red one is fully received on that link, yes, but, cannot but cannot be sent until the green due finishes. to delay, so I'm sending it here, and then, I have to wait the end of this one to so. so the question is what is B the bandwidth of that thing? So here I can measure that that span of time. Hmm? I can measure everything here. Yeah, the, the the span of time between the the green one and the red one. Yes. 
can measure everything you want from here. <coughs> and if I know the the size of the red one before the bottleneck, mm -hmm. I should be able to calculate. You know it after the size has not changed. The size is the same. Yeah, yeah. It's just the time to send it that changes. So give me the formula. What is important to measure is this time between so you between the time you receive the red one and the green one. Okay? So in fact, this time, so here it's the opposite of this drawing, but this time represent this. So you see, here I have also the representation order. So transmission is in which way you, you read it. So that's our problem. But I will say that I have received this packet at uh, T0 and this one I T1. So the transmission, the delay is here. And this delay, T0 minus uh, T1 minus T0, is the same here. <coughs> of course, it's not the same time, but the, the delay has been introduced by the bottleneck and so by this packet. And so I know that this, I know the length for this packet. I don't know, of course, the bandwidth. So what do I do? I say that T0 T1 minus T0, so what I have here, is equal to the length divided by the bandwidth. So, I can compute the bandwidth here, and the bandwidth is equal to the interval time of my packets divided by the length of the packet. And so this way, by analyzing the gap between the two packets, I can measure the bandwidth I have and my bottom. So that's the last concept of this class. My goal is not to go into uh, the technology because you will see uh, the technology during the, the other class. So this afternoon uh, we will do another exercise that is, and we do an exercise on uh, ISDN on, on Friday. We'll do another exercise that I don't know yet. I have the choice between two exercises. I will know which one I, I gave you. It depends how you accept French in uh, exercise. So, yes? Isn't the ratio the other way around? The other way around. Because the bandwidth units are uh, size over time. Yeah? And it's, it's backwards. In the slide. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I will check. But sure. Okay, so here we are going to see a prediction oriented versus datagram. So we already talked about that. And I think the best way to make the difference between them is to come back to. What we saw before, we know that it was not a good technology, but it's when you have a message to send, you have a first part where you have to tell the network where to send the information. But of course, we saw that message is not good because message is too big, and so we have to cut the message into pieces, into packets. To, uh, to send the information, okay? So here I have this, uh, this message. I am sending it on the wire, and of course I have to make a link between the way to signal the network and the packet I have here. 
So I can do the link. So if I have in connection-oriented mode, I will ask the network, as I said before, and I will say, tell me, open me, uh, give me, uh, create a context on the network to allow me to send this packet. And the network will give you back an ID. And you will use this ID, and you will add this ID on all the fragments here to be sure that the packet will be will go to the good right direction. So this is one way to do it. The advantage of this way is that the ID can be very small. You don't have to put large addresses or ever because here you already ask the network before, and so you store all the information. So this is one, one possibility. So this is connection-oriented mode. So we will need a dialogue with the network and to get an ID. The other possibility is to add something where we will copy on each fragment the destination address. So here, of course, the header will have to be bigger because instead of just an ID that will identify a flow, we have to identify a user among all the users on the network. So here it, may, it can be larger to, to add this information. And of course, here, since I have the address on each packet, each packet can be uh, process individually. So that's what we call a datagram. So what's the advantage of connection-oriented? Is that I make a link between packets. So since I make a link between packets, my network will be aware about this flow. So my network, for example, can process differently a flow than another because I have put some property to identify on each packet here, each fragment, that it belongs to the same flow. So my, net my network see flows. On the other case, when I am in datagram, each packet are processed individually, so my network will never see a flow, but just see packet, another packet, another packet, but cannot process a flow directly. For example, here, if I ask the network to send at 2 megabit per second and I am sending at 3 megabit per second, then the network can see it. Because it know, even in the middle, that it receives packet for this flow at 3 megabit per second. And I ask at the beginning, I want to send at 2 megabit per second. So my network can control. My network can offer me guarantees on the flows. Because if it sees, for example, that there is too much delay, then it can adapt the configuration to reduce the delay. Because it sees a flow. Here, it just sees individual packets, so it cannot help me to uh, add a better quality of service to the packet. So that's why you have a big fight between these two communities. So some people prefer connection-oriented because they say the network can offer me better quality. But the risk is to have a very complex implementation inside the network. And you have datagram community that say, okay, we don't care about quality because we have enough bandwidth. And so the, ba the increase of the bandwidth will increase the quality. So we don't, it's, it's no use to add quality of service notion. And it's better to process each packet as, they can, as the network can. And we talk about best effort in that, uh, for datagram. It means that the network does its best, but there is no guarantee that it works. So you have these two communities that fight, but sometimes, and you will see that uh, when we study MPLS uh, for the next class, uh, when we will see routing so for DCN next year and uh, for master specialisé uh, next month. So for MPLS, for example, we can apply in some part of the network some connection-oriented mode 
for the network to process the packet with quality of service or to guarantee some contract on other part just in data graph. So it's you have you can you can do both. So what um, if we go to prediction oriented? I talk about an ID. An ID. What you have to see understood is that the ID is not maybe the same for everywhere on the network, but can be also different from part of the network to another part of the network. And if the ID change from one part of the network to another, it's what we call a virtual circuit. So what does it mean when we create a virtual circuit? It means that you talk to your signaling protocol. So you talk to your signaling protocol and you say, I want to establish a circuit. And you get an ID. So your ID will be identified, for example, on the line, on the interface, you receive the information. And we have also a path here that will find the path to go to the destination and will create a state on all the intermediary nodes. So this state will contain something that says if I receive on that interface something with its ID, I will have to send it on this interface with so another interface with another ID. So why we use we switch from one ID to another? It's because it's very it will be very complex to maintain unicity around the world on IDs. So it's better just to guarantee unicity of the ID on the wire between two devices. So for example, I, have, I am in, uh, if we take the example, I am in Le Havre and I am in Lille. So Le Havre wants to go to Pau and Lille wants to go to Nice. Each of them can use, for example, ID2 to, to talk to the network and say, I want to go to Pau. So the network will say, use ID Two. And here, a host in Lille will talk to the network and say, I want to go to Nice. And the network will say, use ID2. These ideas are unique because they belong to the same link, the two different links. But now we have to send data to N. So we have to switch. So here you have interface one, interface two, interface three. So if I, we keep the same ID, of course here they will have confusion because we use ID two on both cases. So what we will do is to have a switching matrix that say that in interface one, when will you receive something with ID equal to two, then you send it to interface three, so the, this way we have the path, and you put ID equal three. So this way I establish a link here, and the packet that this sender will send with ID two will be sent directly, so we don't have to ask physical question, metaphysical question, is just send it on interface three, but change the ID to three. And here, if I receive an interface 2, so the interface is different, something with ID equal to 2, then I have to send it to interface 3. And here, for example, I will take ID 4. So now on that link, I will have two flows, one with ID 3 and the other one with ID 4. OK? So here, I am unsegment, but I can still differentiate the two flows because here, the ID are different, even if the link is the same. 
Here, the idea is the same, but the link is different. So this way we can, we don't have to bother about global unicity, because if I want global unicity of ID, it means that I will have very, very large ID, and it will be like addresses, or even bigger than addresses. Here, I don't care about unicity, or global unicity, I just manage unicity on the list. So here is an example. So you have a network. And on this network, you have different links that goes from uh, one node to another one, from one router to another router. So what you have is a switching matrix here on each node that tells you what to do on the network. So for example, if you receive, so you have a packet to destination alpha, and destination alpha is, you can connect, it's connected to router R4. So what do you do here? And router R7, you say, okay, I want to join alpha. So I have to send it on interface A with value ID 10. So the packet arrives to at the end of this link, and here it's received on locally an interface number D. So what I do here is when you receive something on interface D with value 10, then you send it an interface B with value 20. So you send the packet here, so you see that it's very, very you go very quickly to go from one interface to the other because you have to look at this table. And this table contains only active flows. So here, you send it to an interface B. So it's received on router 11. With, so router 11 will receive it on interface C with the value 20. So then you have to, it says that you have to send it to B with value 10. It arrives here with value 10 on interface D, and here it says you have to send it on D with value 15. And then you reach the destination. So this is called a virtual circuit, because here you don't create really a circuit using wire. So it's virtual because it's just switching matrix that has been established on each link. And you create a path here from this point to this point. So what is important to notice also is that the ID I use locally is different from the ID that will receive F4. So it means that if we continue to have this notion of black box, And we use the OSI vocabulary. So here what I do, I do a connection request. And I put the address of the destination. So the address of R4. So here I use an addressing scheme, like a phone number or what you want. So my signaling protocol will set up all the switching matrix in the intermediate. So find the path and set up the switching matrix to have this result. And here, we'll send a connection uh, information. Yeah. Request to tell you that you have something that comes from the network. Indication. Uh, and so here what they say, they tell you that something from R7 is calling you and VID will be 15. Okay? So here's the local value I will receive, 15. 
And so now, when are we receive, when, therefore, we receive something with 15, he will know that it comes from R7. Okay, so after that, all the packet you will receive will have just the ID 15. And here, you will have a confirmation. So connection confirmation. That will say, okay, use ID 10. Okay? So what does it mean? It means that R7, when he wants to send information to R4, will use the ID 10. But it doesn't know that the other guy will receive things with ID 15. That's network business. You have to think locally. So you, you just focus on your interaction between you and the network. And you know that you have to interact with value 10. And the other guy has to focus with interaction with the network. And he knows that when he receives something with value 15, or he wants to send things, in some case, it's not uh, always bidirectional. But in some case, if it was bidirectional, when he sends something with value 15, then it will go to R7. So, that's what we call in um, a virtual circuit, or in IP, in MPLS world. So that example is taken from MPLS slide. It's called a, logic, uh, a logical switching path. LSP. So you have plenty of names to designate the same thing. Lot of acronyms that does uh, that means the same thing. So this way you <laughs> you can play with yes. little games. Okay. So this is virtual circuit. If I look at datagrams, datagram is. Uh, more complex to, to manage, or oh. it's simpler to implement because the line of code you have to put on your router if you are in datagram are less than if you have to manage connection for your circuit. But so the goal of IP, if you remember the OSI model, in the OSI model it was like Lego, so we have different bricks. We have a bricks number one, a bricks number two, etc., etc., and we stack all that bricks to make a nice building of seven layers. And of course, in the model, it's very strict. Every layer has the same size. So here, it's a very popular view of the internet that has been introduced by Steve Deering, and it's what we call the hourglass model. So it has seven layers. Because seven, I told you, is a magical number. <coughs> but if you look closely, it was just for the beauty of the thing to have seven layers and to look like the OSI model. Because in fact, they, you have some uh, application. You see, www is here, but HTTP is at level six, which is not very logical. And here you have uh, the physical layer or the physical media that is here which is, doesn't reflect the OSI view of the network. So just seven layers, because uh, seven is very popular. But in fact, in the IP model, you have less layers. You have layer two and one, which is called interface. You have IP. Then you have TCP, UDP, SCTP, DHCP, that are some on extra extra, some <coughs> layer 4 protocols. And then you have your application. So this is a more realistic view of 
IP model, but if we try to map to seven layer, we have this. And what is interesting to see is that IP is represented as a very small protocol. So in fact, when you, you know that IP has been standardized by uh, IETF, and if you look to other protocol, for example, there was a few years ago a protocol, a connection-oriented protocol that was called ATM. So the name of ATM was a synchronous transfer mode. But people from IETF call ATM a terrible mistake. <laughs> because they didn't believe in a connection-oriented mode and all the stuff that was inside uh, uh, ATM. But people from ITU that standardize ATM call IP impotent protocol. So a protocol that does nothing. Because the only goal of IP is to forward packets from one point to another. So that's why IP is, looks very small. Because it, it tries to do, to do only one thing. Take a packet and forward as fast as possible the information to the other end. So there is no signaling protocol. You have just routing table that knows about all the address on top. So as you know, the address are hierarchical. So you don't have to know all the addresses, but only one part of the address. Like in a postal network, you have the country. And if you know the country, you don't have to know all the cities of a country. You just know, if I want to send to India, I send that. And then in India, we will know about the cities, etc., etc. So in IP, you have the same hierarchical addressing scheme. It means that in IPv4, you have about, uh, let's say, 400,000 routes in routers that are in the middle of the network. So each time a packet arrives, you have to find, look at the 4,000 uh, 400,000 routes to find how you leave the router. So you have to check all that, but the process by itself is very simple. Just look at the yeah. address. So it means that IP has to be very simple, not, it's not a very sophisticated protocol. So it has three good advantages. First one, that is very simple, so it's very easy to adapt IP to any layer two because you don't have to make a lot of complex things. You have also, when you have to write an application, you don't have, you don't have a lot of powerful uh, function to use. So it's very easy to adapt IP to uh, application to IP. And the last thing is that since, since IP is simple, it's easy to implement it on all the devices. And that's something that is, leads to something very strange, which is not obvious, is that in fact IP is not, is what we call an interconnection protocol. It means that it's a common language between everything. So it means that this computer took IP, my intermediary system has have implemented IP. And when I go, for example, to a Google server, this Google server talks IP. So this layer 3 is a common language between all the equipment. So you may know that we have some trouble now with IP. Because when you look at IP, I told you that you have a destination address somewhere, and this destination address has to be, uh, you have to look at about the 400,000 uh, routes you have in the router. So the router has a database, and this database contains 400,000 entries, and for each packet, you have to check among these 400,000 entries to see how you leave the router. So this has to be done very, very quickly, especially in you are in a core network, because here in the core network you will have a very large database and very high speed links. 
So you have to do it very, very, very quick. That's why the IP protocol is very simple. And one way to optimize things was to say that the IP address is 32-bit long. And every packet, every device on Earth knows that the IP address is 32-bit long. And it leads to 4 billion, about 4 billion addresses on Earth. And it's a quite small number. And in uh, February, the, the pool of addresses has been existed. So it means that nowadays, and maybe at the end of this year, it will be not possible to request new addresses. It's a problem for, for the network, so we have to change and go from one version that is called IPv4 to a new version that is called IPv6. The address in IPv6 is 128 bits, which, is a, which leads to a very, very huge number of addresses. You go to power 128, so you have no limitation, but it means that you have to change everything. You have to change your application, and you have to change all your operating system and all your router to take into account this protocol. So that's something very, very complex. And nobody wants to do it. So that's a big problem, but nowadays we have no more address. So people will be forced to move because there is no other solution. So this model is called inter uh, interconnection model because we took the same language everywhere. Which looks logical for IP, but in fact, if you think, it's not so logical when you talk about networks. For example, if I look at the electrical network, when I want to, uh, to connect an equipment, a device on it, I have this kind of plug. But the nuclear power plant that produces the electricity for, uh, for us, doesn't have this kind of plug to be connected to the grid. So you have a different interface. So here, as a user, I have one interface to connect to the network. And on the other side of the network, I can be connected with another protocol. For example, when you phone you are uh, doing a phone call between your mobile phone to a old telephone. Then you have two interfaces, two different interfaces, and the network will change from one in the format to another one. And for example, we can imagine that you have different protocols that can handle better server or produce information than this one that consumes information. And we don't have that with IP. We have the same protocol everywhere. So it means that when we want, we want to design a server that has to send a lot of flows, then you have some limitation. Because we all host are equal. So for some application it's good, and it works well because everybody uses it, but it has also some drawbacks. So we can, if you, when you will be in master of of science in red, will talk also to some evolution that people think about the IP model to make it work differently to adapt to these new things. So to, to conclude, so here it's a very simplified IP header. And as I said, the A address has a very special location in the IP header. First, it's always at the same place, at the same location in the header. So this way you can recognize it, you can take it very quickly. The size is well known, 32 bits. And it is also a link, you have an alignment in memory. It means that one by one instruction, you, know, you can read it. So it's aligned on 32 bits, and so you can take it very quickly. So that was the, one of the good ideas of IP that make it very popular, because it was very efficient on computers. Because computers can process very quickly. 
And by little by little, IP becomes the universal protocol. So I will talk more of that in my class about IP next month. But this is, you see, one, di one difference. It means that here we, there's a fact that we want to have something efficient. The, net the network evolution is blocked because everybody has to talk the same way. So when you are in connection-oriented mode, it's more complex to, to use it, but you have more flexibility. 